So our second working group report is from the Genomic Data Science Working Group. Uh, the, the, the two co-chairs of that working group are Shannon McWheeney from Oregon Health Sciences University and Anshul Kundaje from Stanford University. And they're going to, is this a tag team? Are you sharing? And if so, who's batting lead off? All right, can you see the slides? Yes, we can. <clears throat> All right. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity to present today. So we're representing um, uh, the uh, NGRI Genomic Data Science Working Group. Um, um, I, will, I will give a brief introduction to the working group, and then Shannon will dive deeper into some of our uh, ongoing activities. Um, just very briefly, let's see. There you go. Um, yeah, so let's just uh, give a quick introduction to what this uh, working group is. Um, it's a subcommittee of NHGRI, and it was formed in 2017. Um, and we hold our meetings uh, virtually uh, every two months. Um, what this uh, group is 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 doing is um, uh, its main roles are to advise NHGRI on plans related to genomic data science uh, outside of the council meetings. Um, we provide input to uh, NHGRI director and other institute leaders about uh, trans NIH issues related data science, and we also try to address broader challenges, uh, including data management, uh, computing, data science policy, as they relate to genomics, uh, from basic science to genomic medicine. <clears throat> this is our current makeup. So um, uh, <clears throat> as of February 2024, we have 12 members. Um, um, Shannon and I uh, are the outgoing uh, co-chairs for 2023. And uh, Tim Reddy and um, <clears throat> Casey Taylor will be taking over as the new co-chairs for 2024. Um, also want to thank uh, uh, Gail uh, Jarvik for um, her service on, on this. Uh, she rotated out um, at the end of 2023 and Iftikhar uh, Kulo rotated in um, uh, early 2024. Um, and I believe uh, Tim and Iftikhar are uh, on council. <clears throat> We also, of course, have energy rep representatives on the call, um, Eric Green, Valentina, Helen Thompson. Um, and so that's our current makeup. Uh, so very quickly, I'll just go over some of the uh, topics that we discussed over the last year. Um, <clears throat> so we started off with uh, you know, discussing um, various offerings by energy RI's training program um, with a specific focus on uh, genomic data science uh, training opportunities and multiple career, career stages, um, and also focusing quite a bit on diversifying uh, the workforce. Um, we also discussed several new initiatives and renewals uh, that were brought back to the working group for feedback. Um, so the first one um, was a new initiative that is called uh, MLAI Tools for Advanced Genomic Translational Research. Um, the aim of this uh, initiative is to create a foundation for the development and validation of ML and AI tools to be used in cl clinical genomic research, and also a systematic approach for assessing um, ethical, legal, and social implications of utilizing these tools in clinical decision making. Uh, the working group expressed support for this concept and highlighted the importance of validating these tools uh, for clinical applications across uh, the clinical research sites. And this initiative, I believe, was cleared by Nigeria Council in May 2023. <clears throat> um, the computational data uh, genomics uh, and data science uh, uh, PARs, uh, program announcements, were also brought to the working group to discuss their renewal in 2024. Um, these two PARs were released uh, in 2018 um, with the goal of soliciting in instigator, in in investigator initiated applications across a broad range of computational genomics and data science topics. Again, the working group was supportive of the renewal and made suggestions to focus uh, their scope, to expand the pool of new and early stage investigators. And these funding opportunities uh, are presented for clearance uh, uh, by the council today. Um, finally, the group reviewed information uh, provided by Energy RI staff about the genomic uh, community resources portfolio. And we'll talk about uh, that a little more in the next few slides. Um, and we generated quite a few recommendations for NGRI to consider. Um, so as we go forward, we'll, we'll spend quite a bit of effort on this. And I'll hand it off to Shannon to take that on. 
So uh, we undertook a review of the community resources and what we were specifically looking at were um, primarily the PARs that came from investigator initiated applications, um, in particular for the resource related projects, we're thinking about the U24s and these are both ones that are specific to NHGRI as well as those that were um, you know, across NIH. Uh, the ones that were trans NIH really were focused on data repositories and knowledge bases while um, there was a broader scope for those from NHGRI. Um, and uh, the things that we didn't kind of leave off the table as we were doing this review included um, things in which there was a specific solicited RFA. So for example, ANVIL or ENCODE, those were not part of this review. But we were just trying to understand as a whole uh, the composition of um, uh, the current community resources uh, in genomics. Can go to the next slide. And can you click it one more time, please? So we have both charts. Thanks, perfect. Um, so what we're looking at right now is uh, the investments that's been made in terms of the resource funding as well as the number of resources. Uh, and in 2023, we were, um, you know, end of 2022, we were investing, and it's year I was investing uh, approximately $70 million in these community resources. That is just for perspective around 17% of the grant budget for NHGRI. Uh, and it is actually a larger percentage than any of the other managed programs. Uh, we also recognize as a group, especially given the landscape, that this is likely to increase. Um, while they're mostly, as I already mentioned, comprised of um, data and software, uh, informatics resources, um, uh, they do tend to receive, because of the, the need for stability, longer term funding. And so I think this really set up nicely uh, as part of this review, the perspective of how do you balance um, the, the need for support and stability of these long-term community resources that are heavily utilized, like the U24s, as well as innovation, which we often think of coming from the R1. Can we go to the next slide? So uh, we uh, had a number of presentations around the current NHGRI uh, funded genomic uh, portfolio. Uh, and then we actually formed a subgroup uh, to address questions that had been posed by NHGRI uh, in order to provide some guidance, and we generated a list of uh, recommendations. Um, so in addition to those presentations that I already mentioned, we had a series of small group working meetings. We also had requests for additional information and data so that we could look at that. Uh, and we had a meeting then between the co-leads uh, of this working group and um, and HGRI, and then finally, uh, the entire working group reviewed the draft, and it was finalized on November 9th. And so the next set of slides are really just going to highlight the final recommendations um, from this working group. So one of the key um, questions that came up was around the global core of biodata resources. Uh, so uh, there are currently, or at the time we put these slides together, there were 52. Um, global core biodata resources that were recognized internationally. 20 of those are funded by NHGRI. Um, and so a, a key uh, question, uh, because these are also obviously you know, being recognized as key resources, there was a, a comment and, and kind of a recommendation from the working group that NHGRI should assess which of these resources really are at the forefront of genomics. Um, because as we know, genomics extends beyond NHGRI. And so again, and this will be kind of a theme, there was definitely uh, thoughtfulness around alignment with the st uh, um, strategic vision and mission for NHGRI. And also, again, really trying to think about impact and um, innovation. And so uh, while we do value the Global Biodata Coalition uh, designation, and we think it's actually critical because it really highlights how valuable these resources are, we also thought that there still should be some introspection in terms of um, the, the, that, that component of the portfolio uh, relative to where the field is headed and definitely um, alignment with the larger goals of uh, NHGRI. Can you go to the next slide? So we also uh, talked a great deal about strategic growth and this goes again to the idea of um, trying to achieve that balance between sustainability for these community resources, um, as well as 
um, making sure that there is still sufficient resources for uh, innovation. Uh, and in particular, there was a lot of thought around the R01 portfolio. So there was a unanimous recommendation that there really needs to be strategic planning uh, around uh, the growth of the resources. And in particular, we highlighted this idea of a resource life cycle framework, right? So when we think about the investment, we really wanted to be thinking about it on this continuum. So when we're thinking about early stage resources, that is a time where it's higher risk, there's really a focus on innovation. Um, then, you, you know, as they mature, we want to maintain competitiveness, really looking at collaboration and also value and impact. Uh, when we're thinking about those that are mid or mature. And then very importantly, and I think this has been a bit of a blind spot, not just for NHCRI, but I think just across the NIH portfolio, we need to have a, a clear plan for either consolidation or ramp down at the end of the cycle. Um, because these resources can be assimilated or integrated into other aspects of the by consolidation, uh, or they may just uh, have, have come to a maturity but that needs to be planned from the very beginning. So when we think about both the, the thing about this life cycle, the funding that might be um, associated with each stage, but then very much that there is this overall plan as we're taking new resources into the portfolio. The investments obviously in the early stage would focus on cost effectiveness, impact and integration with the NHGRI ecosystem. So they shouldn't be made in isolation. We definitely want the innovation. We definitely want uh, the novelty. As I mentioned, they could be higher risk, but Really, and again, this theme will come up over and over, you have to be looking at the entire research portfolio, or in this case, resource portfolio. Uh, and so what, does, what is the implication here for budget? That the budget allocation for the resources should be adequate to strategically support each of these stages. And as I mentioned, I think where the, the gap may have been is in this last stage, the consolidation and ramp down. We've actually had mechanisms around early stage and uh, mid or mature over time. But that, that last piece is one that really is critical, especially for sustainability, because the community becomes dependent upon aspects of these resources. Can go to the next slide? So we were also asked to consider about, and this really is the heart of this, balancing the investments in research versus resources. Um, there was clear recognition that the research grants, in particular the R01s and R21 mechanisms, are really critical for innovation. We did feel, though, that the resources, when we reviewed the portfolio, do enable innovative research through data and tools, and they have a really critical capacity building role that should be considered when we're making funding things. And this sometimes gets missed because we tend to think of the resources as infrastructure and just focus on the innovation piece from the R01 and R21. But there, there really is, and maybe that's also another metric that we, we're looking at or, or, or characteristic when, when um, funny decisions are being made. But the capacity building component and the innovation that comes from these resources is clearly there when we review the portfolio and something that needs to be recognized. Okay, the next slide. So uh, this is one that was actually uh, quite an interesting discussion. We talked about sustainability planning. Because immediately ideas started to come in around the idea of uh, potential um, mechanisms for sustainability with regard to um, seeds, et cetera. And um, what is very clear is that NHGRI does endorse free and unencumbered access to the resources, which is actually very much in line with uh, global forest eligibility requirements. Um, and we don't have any predefined investment capture limits on the number of years of funding that we could actually come to grips with. So what became clear instead is that, and you're gonna see this I think as we get to the conclusion, this type of portfolio review that we did and this type of landscape analysis is critical. It is something that is going to be continually needed to be done. Uh, again, really reviewing this in terms of both innovation and alignment and, and usage. Uh, and I think what will be key, since we really weren't recommending this idea of a cap and when you know clearly there is not an ability to generate uh, other funds for this, given uh, the need that these are accessible, which we do agree with. Uh, that's again highlighting why this off ramping mechanism is so critical at the end of the life cycle. Uh, and this could be measured by a number of metrics in terms of uh, usage or redundancy, et cetera. This is again why that landscape analysis is so important. Can you go to the next slide? So I think I've really been um, kind of uh, driving to this point, which is, it, all of our recommendations really kept coming back to this idea 
you know, we did a portfolio review, but um, for NHGRI itself to really do a very detailed landscape analysis hand in hand with a needs assessment in terms of needs and gaps. So one of the things that the landscape analysis will give you is this idea of redundancy uh, in terms of where we have a lot of uh, overlap. Um, and also we'll highlight the, the gaps, right? Where are there areas where we have very few resources? Where are the emerging areas in which there's gonna be key needs for infrastructure? Um, this also would help in identifying not just the overlap, but also the synergy between the existing resources, right? And, and again, we talked about this idea in the last stage of the life cycle around not just offering, but also consolidation. And if you understand that synergy, that would be key. Uh, and then obviously this goes back to impact. So what is the value of the resource utilization? Uh, and we do recognize that this is nuanced and complex. And so that's why this is actually going to need to be very much um, uh, engaged with the community in, term, in terms of this, but it's also dynamic because these needs are changing over time. Again, very importantly, thinking about the strategic plan and vision for NHGRI, the portfolio really needs to align with this concept of the forefront of genomics. Uh, and that's why that off ramp will be so important as resources uh, kind of move into a stage in which um, they can feel they're uh, redundant or uh, no longer at the forefront. And especially because there are genomic resources coming from other avenues besides NHGRI. Uh, and then critical for engagement and, and also, um, I think, to help with the stability of resources, a clear communication plan about the resource portfolio. And so I mean, I mean this actually in multiple ways. So one is for the existing resources so they understand uh, the constraints and kind of the landscape. Two, in terms of the investigators understanding what is out there and the, the ability to utilize these. And then three, at NHGRI internally, really has um, this clear picture of the portfolio in the ways that we're describing, right? So where are we doing very, very well? Maybe potentially where do we have um, an overabundance of resources? Where are we having gaps even historically? And where are we seeing new trends, especially when we think about the forefront, where we don't have resources yet? And that having that help shape um, ultimately not just the sustainability of the portfolio, but also its development. So uh, in addition to this, um, and, and as I mentioned to you, this finished in November, we also highlighted a number of upcoming uh, working group discussion topics. Uh, so one was around phenotypic data collection and sharing across the NHGRI programs, and this aligns to a number of concepts in terms of both uh, the, um, not just the phenotypes themselves, but the standardization mechanisms by which they're uh, collected and shared. I'm going to make a comment that actually dovetails really beautifully into a lower bullet. Uh, when we think about data collection in general right now, we really need to be thinking about it in terms of making sure that the data is what we call AI ready or AI ML ready. Um, so again, having that lens on the entire time, not just kind of switching lens between AI and, and the phenotypes. Um, also, uh, another topic is around genomics research transition to the cloud. Um, we had uh, discussions already about the potential for hosting a working group workshop. Um, and then, as I mentioned, and I think this is really on a lot of people's minds, not just uh, across NIH, um, you know, but specifically, how do we make the NHGRI data ecosystem more fair, uh, AI, ML ready, and equitable? And I think we have a lot of um, potential for this because of the fact that one of the flagship Bridge to AI projects is clearly focused. Uh, on NHGRI. Uh, and so the tools, um, the resources, the standards, all, all of the things that are coming out of those initiatives actually it is critical that those are brought back in and help shape the ecosystem. And, uh, and I think that there's a lot of things that are coming from this already just in terms of licensing and ask, um, uh, access and in particular ethics that really are presenting, uh, potentially have the ability to change the landscape. And then the last topic, which is not a small one, we recognize was on the unification of knowledge. Group. So that's what's uh, on the docket coming up. Uh, and then finally, we just wanted to acknowledge the working group and then obviously the NHGRI Office of Genomic Data Science. And um, Angela and I are both happy to take any questions. Questions, Peter, go ahead. Uh, I was a little, I had a question about the Global Biodata Consortium. Is 
is this now sort of an official organism, uh, it's not organism, an official organization whose purpose it is to sort of assess resources for NIH? Because um, I just became aware of that a year ago. It's got very heterogeneous resources and I'm not sure the decision processes are very transparent. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure I, I understand what I would need to do as the owner of a resource if I wanted to, I mean, do I need to get approval from them now? <laughs> so, so, so I, Peter, hi, Peter. I, I apologize if I uh, made it sound like that's part of NIH. We were actually assessing, so that this is outside of NIH. And um, I can send, or I can put into the chat the links around what their criteria is for eligibility. We already mentioned the idea of the um, ensuring that there's uh, free and democratized access uh, to the resources, but there are many others, many other criteria. But no, it's an outside designation. It just so happens that uh, a number of them are genomic. And as you saw for the current list of about 52, uh, a considerable number, 20 of them, were NHGRI funded. So we were commenting on that. One of the things that we were asked to reflect on was because this is new and, and these resources have been awarded this designation, um, that could actually go in a couple of different directions, right? Because you could be thinking about the fact that um, this designation is actually really critical and maybe more important or because they're already recognized. So we were just being asked to consider that in terms of a larger portfolio, but it's not an NIH designation. And, and this is Eric. I'll, I'll just put a few more comments on this. I was, I am, continue to be heavily involved in the Global Biodata Coalition. It is a coalition of fund, international funders. It is, it's been around for a little while. They've done two rounds of an open call for resources to come in to try to get the designation of being a global core biodata resource. Um, it has very much been adapted, or it's been, it's modeled after the Elixir system that they have in Europe, which is a way for the European funders to prioritize investments in data resources. And we, we are basically have just tried to globalize this. Um, Valentina uh, on our staff certainly has been quite involved and has in fact been involved in the evaluation processes for this. I think Shannon's point of just giving, I mean, it, there is a certain circularity about this because I'm a big enthusiast. I'm one of the founders of it. And so my expectation was that NHGRI funded resources would um, uh, apply to get that designation. So they did it in force and not surprisingly because they're heavily used, they, a lot of them got it, um, but not all of them I don't think got it. So it was the great majority. So, but it's still something that is um, off the books. I mean, there's nothing official about it with NIH, although more and more parts of NIH, I think, are learning to admire it and its value. And Valentin, you want to add something? I, I just want to add, I mean, one of the major goals was really to identify the size of the problem. I mean, really, with the identification of the core biodata resources at the global level, you could basically quantify what is really the the cost in terms of resources needed, staff, and support. And, and, and because these are valuable resources that are broadly used across the world, then you could have with 50, I mean, they, everybody was expecting more of those, but about 50 of them, and therefore try to understand what type of support is needed from international funders. So mission achieved. As far as I understand, there's not going to be a third round for the moment. Yeah. Other questions? All right, uh, Shannon and Anshul, thank you for your work on the working group and thank you for this report. We will hear from you again. Good day.